right. Good to see everybody here tonight. Just a little bit more on this, Brother Dean, if you would. Good to see you in church this evening. Take a songbook. Let's start by singing together, okay? 195, if you will, please. 195, down at the cross. Glory to his name. Let's stand together to sing it. 195, Brother Bob Elise. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing. evening and uh, I like to hear God's people sing don't you and uh, nothing like it in all the world and uh, good to have you here tonight glad you made the time to be here in church on Wednesday evening looking forward to what God has for us tonight all right let's pray together shall we father we bow before you here at the beginning of the service and Lord we do sing and we say glory to your name for so great salvation that you provided for us Lord thank you for so loving the world that you gave your only begotten son whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life lord we love you this evening we thank you for the health and strength you've given to us to be able to be here in church tonight i pray for those unable to be with us this evening if they're ill and they're under the weather would you put your healing hand upon them strengthen them raise them up they could be back with us very soon but father we that are here would ask you to speak to our hearts we don't want to just go through the ritual of saying we went to church wednesday night we want to leaving a little bit saying God met with us tonight we learned something tonight God spoke to my heart tonight and so Lord use the service use the music use our prayer time together uh, use the in honor the teaching of the word of God tonight and Holy Spirit do what only you can do in every heart and life and I'll thank you for it for I pray in Jesus name amen okay you can be seated would you turn with me to number 78 in your hymnal? 7, 8. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Number 78 on that first together. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus.
This evening's missionary message is from the Saunders in Zambia, Africa. Dear praying friends, we're so thankful to everyone who has been lifting up in prayer to our intervening Savior. God has been very good to us about six weeks ago we had a young man visit the church. He came after the service and told me he wanted to know more about Jesus. Several days later, after explaining from the Bible the truths found in God's word, we saw this young man named Cornelius come to know Jesus as his personal savior. He has not missed a worship service since that time, and recently he, we baptized him along with six other new believers. Last week, I received a phone call from Cornelius, and his nephew had passed away. We visited the family and learned that there was really no church involved in the funeral. We use this as an opportunity to minister to his family and preach the gospel. I believe the Lord used the words that we were spoken because the mother of the young boy who died came to church for the first time that Sunday. Amen. Please pray for us as we follow up with his family and the gospel will penetrate their hearts. Recently, we had had three funerals associated with our ministry. One funeral was for an older man named Chrisana. I had many Bible studies with this brother while living in Zambia for the past two years, and Mr. Kazanya always gave a solid testimony of salvation. He had, however, never been scripturally baptized, and it was my pleasure to baptize him. Sadly, we had to have to say goodbye on this earth. We had the funeral service, and probably 400 or more people came. During the period of time known as the three days of mourning, in Zambian culture, several people made professions of faith, and for that we are truly grateful, we rejoice in the hope that we'll see Mr. Gonzana again. In my last prayer letter, I asked for you to pray for Danielle's health. For the last nine months, we have struggled to get diagnosis for a type of autoimmune disease she has. After much counsel from the doctors here and in the States, we feel it is best for us to take an early furlough to make sure we get her health back in order. To our knowledge, she has no major damage to any organs or anything. However, if this problem were to flare up, such damage could occur. If we can know for sure what the problem is, we can take measures to mitigate this possibility. We already have purchased airplane tickets for the flight to the United States and should be arriving at the end of August. It is our desire that we can uh, return to Zambia sometime in February. Please pray for us as we prepare for this unplanned furlough. God has sent us someone, fellow laborers from the Philippines. The Catino family will be watching over our work here in Zambia while we are away. We'll be trying to visit many of our supporting churches while we are in the United States. If you would definitely like to give us an update during this period, please email me at justin.daniel at yahoo.com. Thank you for your love and support for our ministry. God is doing amazing things in this world, and we are pleased to be a part of it. Seeing souls come to know him as a Savior is indescribable. Maybe we are actively witnessing in our own realm of influence and seeking to win the loss for Christ. Lifting up Jesus, Justin Sonder. It's exciting to hear these reports, and especially when I remember they were just here, uh, what, two years ago in a missions conference, and uh, now they're on the field doing the work, and that's exciting, exciting news. And I uh, hope you put Danielle down for prayer that they'll get some answers when they come home uh, for her physical uh, situation. All right. Got your prayer guide with you tonight. Anybody need one? Put your hand up. The usher will get one to you. Anybody without one tonight? Okay. Very good. Start on the back with the coming events, if you will. And uh, are you inside at the CRC prison tomorrow night, 6 30 to 8 30? And uh, we look forward to a good time down there. And uh, then, uh, then our regular Reformers Unanimous here Friday night at the church, 7 p.m. And then we're at the uh, London Prison with RU on Saturday morning from 8.30 to 10.30.
and um, had a good start there last week with uh, 10 men starting out and uh, looking forward to seeing what God's going to do there in London. And then our soul winning visitation as usual on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And then Saturday we have the homecoming uh, reunion barbecue at 4 p.m. All right. And uh, we want to, if you're going to be helping, uh, if you're going to be serving, or if you just want to come and uh, give a hand to make sure everything's all where it needs to be. Um, you, you need to come probably about 2.30, 2.45, and uh, we're going uh, we, we're gonna to try to get this thing set up. You'll see there will only be one entrance. You'll be coming in this way, the Kirk Williams side. This one will be blocked off, and we're going to have some things going on on this side because obviously there's going to be – we're going to have somewhere between probably 180 and 200 people, and uh, it's, we're going to need some parking. And, uh, and we're going to have some activities going on, and we're trying not to mix people with cars. That doesn't always work so well. And uh, so we're, we'll, we'll need some help with the, the parking and such and getting that organized. And uh, so just uh, be prepared for that and uh, be ready to help any way you can and uh, be a blessing to folks on Saturday, all right? We'll have a great time. Different activities will be going on when you come. Uh, we'll, we'll probably eat somewhere uh, a little before 5 o'clock and uh, get everything going, and then around 6, somewhere in there, we'll come in here and have some singing and testimonies, and uh, we'll have a great time, okay? So looking forward to a great time on Saturday. And, of course, Sunday will be the regular services, uh, 9.30 for the Sunday school classes and 10.30 for the morning service, and uh, 6.30 Sunday evening. And uh, we will have the dinner on the grounds right after the service Sunday morning, and uh, that'll be another wonderful time together. Lord willing, uh, Betty Myers, who is the wife of the founder, uh, the first pastor of the church, her and her husband uh, were the ones who started uh, Bible Baptist Church. It actually started as Frank Road Baptist Church down on Frank Road, uh, that elementary school right down there. And uh, they moved up to this property in 1957. And uh, then uh, shortly thereafter, called it Bible Baptist Church. And so uh, she, Lord willing, will be with us on Sunday morning. And we get an opportunity to, to honor her once again. And uh, thank God for their ministry uh, in founding the church uh, 60 years ago. All right. So it's going to be a great time. And uh, looking forward to that. And I hope you are as well. Okay. On the inside of your bulletin if you will the prayer guide of course the praise reports for the report from the prison last week and uh ladies restroom is coming along uh, as you saw the tile has, has been laid and uh more will be done in the next uh a lot's going to be done in the next 48 hours i'll guarantee it and uh just uh fellow's been putting many many hours into that and uh we're thankful for the work that's going on there and uh continue to pray for the different church requests and ministries and uh, those on our health list. Uh, you can put a couple additions there on the health list. Um, Sandy Jenser and Gina Penix are both waiting for back surgery, and so we keep them in prayer. And then Bonnie Slusser, some of you remember Donnie Slusser, he's come, used to come here years ago and he's come back for, some, for a few times here. Uh, it's his mother. Uh, got a note here from Margaret Talde said that <clears throat> his mother Bonnie or no yeah Bonnie uh, broke two bones in her leg but because of medical problems cannot have surgery so uh, pray for her and pray for healing uh, in that situation if you would and uh, good to see Jeanette Anderson here tonight and uh, recovering quite well from her surgery and uh, looking good glad she made it and uh, that's wonderful all right. Pray for the, those in authority, if you would, and uh, our military folks and uh, these uh, battling cancer. I want to remember them in prayer, and then uh, and especially uh, Betty Datum, that is the Mrs. Cato's mother, and uh, Diane Cato is coming in tomorrow, and uh, going to spend a month or so with her mom and helping to care for her. Pray for these on our salvation list, and then of course our unreached people groups that we're going. Uh, praying the Lord to raise up laborers to reach them with the gospel. These are people who don't have a Bible, don't have many of them, any, any written language even, uh, totally unreached, uh, never heard of Jesus Christ, never heard of anything about the Word of God. So we want to pray for the God to reach them and for to raise up laborers to go to them. And then, of course, our missionaries, highlighted tonight by the Sauters in Zambia, and we want to make sure we remember them in prayer and their furlough coming home and that God will take care of all of their needs. All right. Brother Wallace, I want you to come, if you would, and lead us in our prayer tonight. And as Brother Wallace leads us audibly, I want you to pray along with him silently, if you would. 
and uh, let's unite our hearts together as we pray. Okay, Brother Bob? Let us pray. Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity, uh, Lord, the, and the privilege uh, that you have uh, uh, allowed us to be able to come to your throne room and, Lord, approach you uh, as your children, uh, faithfully knowing that you hear and answer our prayer. And, Father, we... Uh, know this just by observing the work that you've done here in the last uh, 60 years at Bible Baptist Church how you've sustained and what a great God you are and uh, Lord the uh, the work that uh, has went on here uh, Lord we give you all the credit uh, that uh, Lord it's been by your power by your uh, know knowledge and by your wisdom that uh, it, it has gotten this far uh, Lord, because you've taken a bunch of nothings through the years and you've made something. And Lord, I just thank you for that. I thank you for allowing us to be a part of it uh, over the years. And uh, Lord, I just uh, can't praise you enough for such a great God that you are. And Lord, I just uh, know that uh, when we pray, when we gather together, Lord, we gather, uh, Lord, uh, hopefully to uh, hear from you and to... Um, uh, Lord, gain a little bit more wisdom and maturity about our Christian life that people would see uh, Christ Jesus in us. Uh, Father, as we lift up the missionaries to you, Father, we do uh, know that they're just families like us, and we know that they have situations, and we know that they trust you and have to walk by faith as we do. Lord, that you promised in your word, uh, uh, Lord, that you would uh, take care of your children. Uh, Lord, the, the first promise you gave clear back in the Garden of Eden uh, that you would put enmity between uh, us and Satan. That one day there was a someone coming who would uh, uh, do the work that only he, you could do. And one day you're going to take care of that person and you're going to take care of that uh, evil one. But Lord, until then, we need your strength. Uh, we need your power. We need your uh, wisdom. We need your uh, 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 wherewithal to do and to stand. And Father, we thank you for the uh, times that you have allowed us to support missionaries over the years. And uh, Lord, we know that uh, uh, you do all things well. Lord, we pray for uh, this uh, new field that we've went into in the last uh, few months of reaching the uh, people who uh, uh, even we don't even know their language. There, there's so many uh, groups of people out there that, uh, Lord, uh, we can't reach unless we have your help. We, we need to come to that point of where we cry out to you and say, Lord, how do you want us to do this? What do you want us to do? Uh, because, uh, uh, Lord, this, this seems like a, for a person like me to stand and look at the situation, I just look at this prayer letter, and I see all the situations and all the families that are represented here. And, and Lord, my strength, I, I can't help none of them. But I've got a great God that I know can fulfill all their needs and some of their desires, as you've promised in your word. And Father, I just pray that uh, uh, these uh, groups, these unreached groups that we pray for each week, Lord, that uh, somehow, some way, expediently, Lord, that you'll get the word to them. Because we know not what the hour or the day is when you will turn to your son and say, go get your bride. It could be tomorrow. But, Lord, I pray that uh, you would uh, help us to expediently get the word out and get uh, furnish the needs, furnish the means by which, uh, Lord, that you would have us go. Uh, give us a blueprint that, that uh, through our pastor that you would have us to go. And, Lord, I, we will thank you and praise you for all that. And Father, I think about the people who are on our cancer list. And Lord, uh, set them on and many others that are there that you could, uh, uh, Lord, go to their bedside tonight and, and be a comfort to them. 
And uh, Lord, uh, do a work in their heart if they're not saved that only you could do. Lord, we do pray for the ministries around our church here. We pray especially for the anniversary that's coming up, Lord, that uh, the, the, we'll have a, a cheerful spirit, a sweet spirit of uh, on the grounds and that Satan will not be able to be allowed here. And Lord, you'll put a hedge about us that, that uh, Lord, only uh, we will know that you're here and, and the, the conversation and the fellowship that we have will be so sweet. But Father, I just pray for these two ladies that we put on our prayer list tonight lord i know nothing about them but you do you know if they're saved if they're not you know what situation they're going through and i pray that you would uh, lord do a work in their lives uh, do have help the doctors to do a work there that that uh, lord that uh, put the right person there at the right time many times in your word uh, lord i read where at that time or at this time uh, for this time and Lord, for this time, we're asking you to put a, put a person in their lives at this time that uh, would uh, uh, do a work that even they would realize that it had to come from God. And Lord, we'll give you all the thanks and praise for it. Father, we do uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity we have to come and open up your word, how precious it is. Uh, Lord, we... Uh, spread it through the prison and the RU ministry. We want to thank you for the time uh, that we had to get, got to go into London last week. We praise you for that. Lord, may that work continue. May it grow. And Lord, I thank you for CRC and the, the time we've been there. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, uh, there'll be a great work that will come out of that place that people will look up and, and uh, Lord, uh, that there'll be great testimonies come from that place. Lord, that, uh, that people will be a stone at, at the, the work that you've done in those men's hearts. And Father, we just again thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. You're so good to us. We don't deserve it, but we sure appreciate it and we thank you for it. Lord, now open up our hearts as our pastor opens up your word and gives us what you've laid on his heart to give us. And Lord, I can't stress enough. Uh, what a serious time this is. Help us to not take it lightly. Every time we open up the pages of your book, Lord, it ought to be so special in our hearts. It ought to humble us to the point of where we crave to hear from you. Father, it is so real, so good so sweet now, Father do a work in each and every one of our hearts tonight that when we leave here we can all say that we've heard from the master we'll give you all the thanks, thanks and praise for it in Jesus name we pray Amen, Amen. 539 together with me. 539, who can cheer the heart like Jesus? Oh, the thrills my soul is Jesus. Let's all stand together one more time. 539, let's sing that first all together. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine. True and tender, pure and precious. Blessed to call him mine. Oh, that thrills my soul in Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Love of Christ so freely given. to me and the fair 
harvest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. Sing that chorus all together. Oh, that thrills my soul as Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. By that crystal flowing river with the ransomed I will sing. Let's sing that last together. We'll have the penis drop out when we uh, get to that chorus. On that last, by the crystal flowing river, with the ransomed I will sing, and forever and forever, praise and glorify the King. Oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. will. Ushers will come and we'll get our offering for the midweek here. And, uh, let's have prayer and we'll ask God's blessing on our giving tonight. Brother Abrams, you lead us in our prayer tonight, please. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Please bless our offering, and uh, may it be of sweet savor to you in our prayers. And uh, we wish that uh, a blessing on all of our uh, missionaries and uh, our pastor as he brings us the word. And we thank you most for your word, Lord. May it last down through the ages. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
and moaning a oh man give thanks to the Lord though your testing seems long in darkness he giveth a song oh rejoice in the Lord he makes no mistake he knows what the end of each path that I take for when I am tried and purified I shall come forth as gold I could not see those with the shadows ahead so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead I bowed to the will of the Master that day then peace came and tears fled away Thank you, Don and Cindy. Take your Bible this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading with verse 11 to follow along. The Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work <coughs> shall be made manifest, <coughs> for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward." If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Father, add your blessing <clears throat> to the reading of the word tonight. And Lord, I'm thankful for what we've already <clears throat> experienced here. Thank you for the wonderful music tonight and the fellowship and our prayer time together. Lord, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. And Father, we now are anxious and we're and eager to open up your word and study it together and I pray that Holy Spirit you'd give us understanding and that you would open our eyes that we could go <clears throat> wondrous things out of thy law tonight so be the master teacher and help us as we study your word tonight I pray in Jesus name amen the passage we just read here in first Corinthians 3 is a judgment for believers now, sometimes we think that uh, believers won't have any judgment, but the Bible teaches differently. Now, we're not going to be judged as far as salvation goes, and in reality, we're not judged for sin, really, because Christ was already took that judgment uh, when He died on the cross, and we trusted Him as our Savior. But we are 
uh, going to stand before God, as is mentioned here, to give an account for the works we've done for Him and the things we've done in our body. In the book of Romans, it says, whether they be good or bad. And so we, we, we understand that there's going to be a judgment of believers, and we're going to be there. They call that the judgment seat of Christ. No unsaved people are here. Only saved people. Uh, there's another judgment called the great white throne judgment, simply because he that sat upon a great white throne. And so it's been called the great white throne judgment. That is only for unbelievers. No, uh, I would say no Christians will be there. No Christians are a part of that judgment. I'm not sure that we won't view that judgment. Uh, we may see that. Uh, it's after that point in time that the Lord wipes away all tears. And I think we may see that judgment of loved ones and uh, folks uh, be cast into hell who knew not Christ as their Savior. But those are the judgments. And uh, we're going to focus on this judgment uh, for our study here this evening. And not necessarily the judgment, but things that we can uh, earn at that judgment or we can uh, gain at that judgment. Our deeds or our works are going to be put through the fire. They're going to be tested by fire to see whether or not they hold their value. Now, several points here about this judgment. Though we find out that though we work together as believers, we will be rewarded individually. You find out earlier uh, in the passage there before we, before we read, notice up in verse number 6, Paul writes, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God gives the increase. Now if you, are, you and I are, are not anything, that means we're nothing. Okay? And, uh, and that's what we are. God likes to take a bunch of nothing and do something with it. Amen? And that's what we are. We're not worried about who gets credit. We're not worried about who did. Listen, God gave the increase. Praise His name. All right? And, and, and we understand we're all working together. You can go out and lead someone to Christ and, and they pray with you and receive Christ as their Savior and you come back and say, hey, I led one to the Lord tonight. Yeah, you might have been one of a dozen or more people that had a part in getting that person to salvation. You got to do the reaping and uh, you don't know how many folks prayed for that person. You don't know how many times somebody gave them a gospel track. You don't know all the things that went on before the fact you came along and got to pick the fruit off the tree. All right? And so don't take a lot of credit for that. Uh, you And sometimes, by the way, you're going to be on the other end of things and you're going to be doing the preparing and you're going to be doing the leaving the track and you're the one who's going to try to pray and water the seed and someone else is going to come along and do it. So it, uh, we, we work together, but here at the judgment, we'll be warded individually. We notice we're partners with God in this work. Partners with God in this work. Look at verse 9. For ye are laborers together with God. How great is that? We're not on our own on this thing. Uh, we are partnering with God. And we get to labor with Him. Not working for salvation, but flowing out of our salvation. Not working to be saved, but working because we are saved. And then we find out the, the, the only foundation, the works foundation here, the only foundation is Jesus Christ Himself. That's the foundation we build on. That's how we know that the people that are here at this judgment are believers because we're building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Any other foundation is sinking sand, as the Lord taught in Matthew 7. All right? Then we find there's two kinds of materials that are being used. Two kinds of materials. There's gold, silver, and precious stones, or there's wood, hay, and stubble. <clears throat> and obviously, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? If it's going to be tested by fire, the wood, hay, and stubble is not the way you want to go. All right? That's not going to make it. And so we understand the choice of material. And so working together in partnership with God and with the Holy Spirit, with Christ as our foundation, uh, we want to use the eternal materials, the things that God values, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And we use those. And, and then our works for Him will pass the test and will receive a reward. That's what the Scripture teaches. Well, well, the fire is going to try it. If every man, verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a what? A reward. A reward. All right, so we're going to talk tonight a little bit about, by the way, if you 
don't abide the fire, you don't get any rewards. Now, it doesn't say you lose your salvation because that's an impossibility. Okay? It's an impossibility because God would have to be a liar if you lost your salvation. Plain and simple. But He gives you, when He promises you eternal life, God has to break His promise if you can lose your salvation. And God cannot break His promise. He has an immutable oath that He's spoken with. And so He won't break His promise. Now, but you will have nothing when you stand before God. So sometimes when people say, well, I'm saved, that's all that matters. No, there is more that matters. And, and there are crowns to win. The Bible uses these rewards in the form of what it calls crowns. We'll say more about the crowns as we get to the end of the lesson tonight. But we want to look at these crowns, these rewards that the Christian can win in the Christian life. Hey, I grew up, I grew up in a very... Um, my, my father, as many of you know, was a, was a professional ball player, uh, baseball, and a pitcher in the Cardinals organization. And, and uh, we, we just grew up competitive. I, had a, I have a brother. I had a brother. He's in heaven now. But uh, he was two years older than, than I was. And he was uh, a, a very good athlete. And we just, uh, we just grew up, I think, in, in our... I think in the crib, my dad put a ball bat inside the crib and a, a football and, you know, that kind of stuff. We just, we, we and, 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 and we're, we're going to play, and if we're going to play, we're going to keep score, you understand? And, uh, and somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose, amen, Brother Yoder? None of this, let's just play for fun. What are you talking about, man? The, the, the fun is winning, man, that's what it is. Man, Brother Taylor, and <laughs> the horseshoes with Brother Taylor now, the act, the activity has changed as we got older, but, uh, you know, the competitiveness is still there. And, and listen, but I don't just want to be competitive in sports and then be passive when it comes to living for Christ. No, if there's, a, if there's a, something to win for Christ, I want to win it. If there's something to gain, I want to gain it. If there's a prize to get, I want to get it. And, and you ought to feel that way about excelling for Jesus Christ. Uh, is an athlete can want to excel for themselves and to get glory for themselves, how much more ought we want to excel for Jesus Christ and bring glory to Him? And so I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to just get along. I want to do my best, and, and I want to obtain these crowns. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go to your right just a little bit there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll talk about the first crown that the Lord says we can get at this judgment. And it is called the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, <clears throat> Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So here's the incorruptible crown that we're looking to gain. All right? Now, think about the Olympic Games. Think about, you know, I remember, you, you, you've seen it, I've seen it. There's a, a race or a contest, and, and uh, you, you've seen the winners, and they, they don't always show it anymore. They used to show it more than what they do now. They show the medal ceremony where they stand on the platform, and they free their medals, and then they play the national anthem of the gold medal winner. <clears throat> and it's not unusual to when they play that anthem of the gold medal winner to they zero in on the face of that one and while they're happy and they're joyful you'll see the tear begin to come down their face because they know all the hard work and all the practices and all the discipline and all the time away from family and all the early mornings and maybe the late nights and all that discipline and all that effort has paid off in a gold medal and they did it for the, their country and, and, and it means something to them and it's how, how precious, it is, precious the medal becomes to the winner. Well, Paul is describing the Christian life here in 1 Corinthians 9 as a race. Know ye not that they who run in a race run all, okay? But one receives the prize. Now, they're running to get a corruptible crown, but we're an incorruptible crown. What we're running for is something much more important than an Olympic gold medal. And which I think the last time I checked was only, uh, believe it or not, valued at 500 some dollars. It's not real expensive anymore. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's, in fact, I won't, 
just, a, just a, this is a parenthesis. Most of the gold medals aren't even made of gold anymore. And uh, so that, that's why the value isn't as, as, as what it used to be. But uh, just food for thought there. In case you're thinking about entering and wanting to get one, you may want to change your mind. But you understand the reward, the, the reward here in the race, as it is in any Olympics, listen, the reward is for the participants, not the spectators. So if you're going to get this award, you've got to participate. Christianity is not a spectator religion. It's not where you come and sit and watch everybody. Okay? It's for you to get involved. It's for you to participate. And you have to compete for the crown. And so now there's, there, there's certain characteristics of the people who, who get involved in this race. Notice what he says in verse 26. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So I'm not running with uncertainty or without certainty, without purpose, without a goal. Okay? I'm intent on winning. I know where I'm headed. Okay? And so we, we, we don't just live haphazardly. We, we press toward the mark. We know where we're headed. All right? So we don't run the race uncertainly. We don't do, he says here, as one, he, I don't fight as one be, that beateth the air. I'm not shadow boxing here. We're not, we're not playing around. We're not just wasting punches. See, it's not, uh, old Brother Roloff used to say, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. That's what, it, that, that's what we have to get the seriousness of it, that, that this, is, this is truly a warfare. And so we're not, <clears throat> we're not, it's not it's, we're, we don't just talk, we just don't talk it, we have, to, we have to walk it. And we have to be serious about it. We have to make sure that we're, <coughs> we're doing what we ought to do and we're putting action behind our talk. And then he says, I keep under, verse 27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. <coughs> Excuse me. Lest by any means, <coughs> when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Try to help my voice here a minute. <coughs> so he's talking about the discipline of his body. Bringing that body into subjection. It's controlling and mastering. Listen, he's talking about dying to the flesh. He's talking about putting that flesh into subjection to what God wants. I don't, I don't just do what I want to do. I'm going to do what God says is right to do. And, and by the way, the flesh is contrary to the spirit and the spirit to the flesh. And so you can't do and, and you can't submit to the flesh and submit to uh, the Lord at the same time. You know, I, I, I remember when uh, back in, I think it was 1967, wasn't it, when Mark Spitz, no, 72 in Munich is when Mark Spitz won his medals. And I remember the reporter talking to him about his training, and, 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 and he won, they won seven gold medals, I think. And, and he, he literally did everything but sleep in the pool. So when did you eat? They put a plate beside the pool, and I ate in the pool. That's he just uh, the the discipline, the schedule, the 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 putting it. Do you think his flesh enjoyed all that? <laughs> I'm sure it didn't. You see, and so we 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 can't give in to the flesh at all. And and he says, so you discipline. Why? Because I want to win the prize. I want to gain the crown. The incorruptible crown. And so I'm going to submit my will and my emotions and, and my thoughts to the will of God, to the Spirit of God. I'm going to bring them into subjection. The incorruptible crown is for those who take the Christian life seriously and discipline their, their, their life so that they don't become disqualified from the race. It's called sometimes the imperishable crown. Because it's given to those who faithfully run the race and crucify the flesh. You see, you're not going to get you're not going to be successful in the Christian life without some sacrifice. If the Lord Jesus had to sacrifice his life, surely we'll have to sacrifice ours. Not by dying on a cross, but by dying to ourselves on a daily basis. And so we'll have to be uh, making sure that some people are called to be a missionary in a far country. They'll go away and they'll spend their life and uh, 
sacrificing money and possessions and lifestyle that they could have had if they stayed home in their own country. So they say they're going to receive a crown, an incorruptible crown. They're going to receive that for faithfully serving God and for sacrificing and for, for denying the flesh. The bottom line is you have to run the race that God has given to you. We're running the race, and Hebrews tells us we run the race, we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So we have to keep our eyes on Jesus, because listen, we're, we're running the race, but it is, while, while it's a, it, it is an individualized race, and it's not a sprint, it is a marathon. You've you got to be in the race of the Christian race for the long haul. Okay? And so when you, when you run a long race, any distance runners, anybody run like cross country or you ran a longer race, anybody in here? Huh? Nikki did some. Mrs. Slayball, you did. Wow, I did not know that. 36 years and you're still finding out things, huh? Holding out on me. Huh? And uh, the one thing you learn in a long race is you better pace yourself. It's funny, when you watch those races in the Olympics and they're doing the 26-mile one, there'll be some guy who'll take off and be way ahead of everybody. And nobody seems to be worried. The announcers are even saying, oh, look at this guy, he's going to run away with it. No, they don't even say much about him. Because when you tune back in like two hours later, you know, and they're still running, that guy's nowhere to be found. He's way back in the pack now. He went shot out there, and boy, he looked great and looked good. And then, but you know what? He was running a pace everybody knew he couldn't sustain. You get the pace <clears throat> that you can sustain. Okay? <clears throat> you may have to run a little harder at times, but listen, if you're going to be in the Christian race for, a, for the long haul, <clears throat> you get a, 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 a pace that you can maintain. Because you're gonna, you want to finish. You want to get the finish line. Okay? Successfully complete the course that God's given to you. And your race is not the same as my race. And, you're, and, and someone else's race is not the same as yours. Well, you, that's why you can't look at somebody else and say, well, how come they're not doing this? Well, how come I'm doing this and they don't? No, 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 no. Because they got a different race to run. And that's why the Lord didn't say, looking unto each other as we run the race. No, you have to look unto Jesus. You're looking unto Him and, and because He's the one you're out to please. Don't look at other people and try to please them as you run. Okay? By the time you do that, you're going to fall. Okay? Nobody runs the race looking at the crowd. Okay? You're going to run into something or trip and fall or hit another runner. It's just it, nothing good's going to happen with that way. Okay? So that's the incorruptible crown. Number two. Let's <clears throat> go to the second crown. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19. Are you doing all right? We're gonna, we got to go quickly, all right? Because uh, the, somehow that clock keeps moving. And uh, we gotta, we got to move quickly here, all right? Notice what Paul writes here, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. He's saying, you are our hope, our joy. You are our crown of rejoicing. Crown of rejoicing. The greatest, and he's talking to these people in Thessalonica whom he led to Christ. The greatest thing, that, listen, the greatest privilege you ever have as a believer is to be able to, to lead someone else to faith in Jesus Christ. What a joy that is. What an honor. And there's no greater joy than that. What a joy it'll be in heaven to meet people that you had a part in leading to Christ. Now walk up and say, thank you. How about the missionaries you support? And people from other countries and other nations will come up and say, I understand you gave to keep the solders on the mission field. Hey, and that Cornelius guy will come up and say, hey, I got saved because you sent them. What a joy that'll be. And Paul said they, are, they were his hope, his joy, his crown of rejoicing. And whenever, if you've ever led someone to Christ, and I pray you have, you know the joy that that brings. Outside of you getting saved, it's the best joy you'll ever experience. Knowing that you had a part in getting someone else to receive Christ as their Savior. Now, 
John 4 and verse 36 reminds us that, that both he that, that, that uh, sows and he that reap, they both gather wages and fruit unto life eternal. But he that, listen, it says, so he that soweth and he that reapeth can rejoice together. Again, that nobody takes the credit by themselves. You realize that we're working together in this. And there's great rejoicing in heaven when one soul repents from Luke chapter 15. And so we're, we're going to be rejoicing there. Several things about receiving this crown. Number one, we must live that others may see Christ in us. We have to live so other people will see Christ in us. But number two, we have to give so that others will know Christ. We have to give so that others will know Christ. Not all of us can go to Zambia, Africa. All of us can go over to Nepal. All of us can go to Mexico. But we can give so those who God speaks to can't go and get the gospel to them. Number three, we must speak that others may know of, know of Christ and we can lead them and give them the gospel of Christ. We have to speak. you got to live right and you want to so live that Christ is in you, but let me ask you a question. You, anybody here ever had someone come up to you and say, you know, I see Jesus so much in you, I'd like to get saved? You'd like that to happen. But the truth of the matter is, we got to open our mouth. you got to speak it. You have to give the gospel. Okay? And so we have to, we have to say about Christ. Now, it's going, to be, it's going to carry more weight and it's going to be more powerful if your life backs up what you're saying. It's a little rough to give the gospel to somebody and they know something in your life. And by the way, unfortunately, that's, that's why, uh, I should say tragically, <laughs> that's why it's so difficult sometimes we say, hard to witness to people who know you, hard to witness to your family and your loved ones. Why is that? Because they know your imperfections. They know your shortcomings. A lot of times we'd rather go out and give the gospel to somebody who doesn't know us and we don't know them. Because they don't know, they can't see our imperfections. But the truth of the matter is, if we're living and for Christ to be seen in our lives, the easiest people to witness to would be our loved ones and our family members. Because they've seen the change in our life. All right? So we have to speak. Whatever you do, listen, don't miss out on the crown of rejoicing. Boy, that's just the crown given to the soul winner. To someone who will lead someone else to faith in Jesus Christ. Faithfully witness. Faithfully give the gospel to others. Tell them about Jesus Christ. And, and be a vessel that God uses to point others to Him. So... Let's go to number three. So we have the first crown, the, the incorruptible crown. The second one, the crown of rejoicing. The third one is James chapter 1 and verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. James 1 and verse 12. If you're there, you say amen. All right. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of what? Life, crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love Him. The Lord's promised this crown to those who love Him. Isn't that interesting? Hey, I, we ought to love Him just because He first loved us. And all that He's done for us, man, how can I help but love Him? But God says, you love me, I'm going to give you a crown for that. That's amazing. That's not just a... Not just a ho-hum love, though. Not just a, I love pizza and I love God and I love chocolate, you know. It's not, that's not the idea that he's talking about here. Not people who say I love him, but there's no outward expression of it. This is someone who loves God and it's obvious they're completely devoted to God. In fact, it's a love for God that causes us to love him more than we love our own life. That's what it's talking about. Scripture says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. With everything that is in us. The kind of love, as we talk about Sunday, that takes up the cross, denies ourself, and follows Him. That's the, 
lover's crown, the crown of life. Jesus said in Mark 8, 35, that whoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake in the gospel, the same shall save it. No, it's, it's the, the love between a husband and a wife. It's the love you had when you started seeing each other or dating one another and you'd put aside anything that hindered you from seeing each other. You cleared the schedule. You made sure that you made time. You, you, you made whatever changes you needed to fit into that person's life and to make sure you were available because you wanted to please them. You wanted to do all you could to care for them. You wanted to let them know that you loved them. And your motivation was you loved them and wanted to be with them. And that's what the Lord's talking about. That's what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he says the love of Christ constrains me. The word constrained there is, is, is literally the word he compels me to do it. What is it that motivates me to do for God what I do for God? It ought to be because I love him. What is it that motivates a husband to do what he should do for his wife? Because he loves her. And the same with a wife for a husband. Because she loves him. Love, listen, that's the, that's the, the, the strongest motivator. You know, it's interesting. Don't, and by the way, you never, and, and those of you in leadership, whether you're a parent, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a pastor, whatever it is, you, you will never motivate people to do great things by guilt. Guilt's a poor motivator. And it's not a long-lasting motivator. It may work for a short period of time, but eventually people will not allow that guilt trip to be on them, and they'll just leave. And so you have to motivate by love. When, when Peter had denied the Lord and cursed and swore, wept bitterly and felt awful about it, and went back to fishing and left the discipling business, Jesus appears to him on the shore. All he had to do, listen, he didn't, he didn't say, what were you thinking? How, man, how dumb were you to follow? Far? Man, you were in the wrong crowd. What was wrong? With, he didn't do any of that. All he said was, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He was just trying to say, Peter, the greatest motivation you're going to have to serve me is you love me. You love me. Peter got the message, and by the way, you read the rest of it. You go from John into, into Acts, and he got the message. Huh? And he stood up for the Lord. Does the love of Christ compel you? That kind of love for Christ will receive the crown of life. It will receive the crown of life. You seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You put God first and loving God first, and all these things will be added unto you. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind, and all your soul. Some believers will endure trials, tribulations, severe suffering, and even death. Jesus says they'll get the crown of life as well. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Obviously, loving God enough to die for Him is the ultimate show of love because greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends when you lay down your life for the Lord there's no greater love and act of love than that and those who've been martyred for their faith throughout history they'll have this crown of life and those who are being martyred in our day will have this crown of life so we have the incorruptible crown the crown of rejoicing the crown of life number four Number four, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Go back to your left from James to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You're familiar with this. This is Paul's last epistle that he pens before he'll be beheaded. He tells Timothy in verse 6, I'm ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course and I've kept the faith. Henceforth. There is laid up for me a what? Crown of, Crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But here's the good part. Not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 
Paul says, I'm getting a reward and I'm getting this crown, but I want you to know it's not just for me. It's not just, not just the, the, the crown of righteousness for Paul, it's the crown of righteousness for all of us who are looking for Christ to come back. Here's the reward for the crown of righteousness is people who've poured out their life as an offering to God. People who've given their lives in service for the Lord. C.T. Studd, the great missionary to India, said that if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for Him. He left behind a life of with the elite in England. He was a uh, great cricket player, somewhere like our baseball here. He was an excellent cricket player and a wife and a children, and he, and he followed God's call to the mission field. Most of you are familiar with Jim Elliott who said he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He said, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. And of course, killed by the very people he was trying to reach. Martyred for Christ. Those are words of determined faith in the Lord. Then it's for those who fight a good fight. Paul said, I fought a good fight. Living, listen, we, we tell the guys at the prison this, but it, it's good for all of us to hear. Living and serving Jesus Christ is not for cowards. It's not for sissies. You've got to be a man. When those men pray and receive Christ their Savior at the prison, we have them stand up. The other fellows have to see them. I want them to know this is, a, this is a man thing. And we're going to take a stand for Jesus Christ right now. And at least the guys in this room are going to know that you've made a decision for Jesus. Men and women of courage and men and women of faith. It's, 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 it's the, the faith of David who when everyone else cowered and ran, went away from the giant, David ran to the giant. That's what we're talking about. You don't just walk in and possess the promised land. The promised land is in heaven. The promised land is, is the abundant Christian life. It is, it is the, 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 the life that God desires for each the victorious Christian life. And they didn't just walk in with no battles. They had to fight for it. But they fought in victory. The Lord promised them, if you fight, I'll give you the victory. You say, well, I don't have victory. Do you fight? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Our problem is we oftentimes don't put up very much resistance. We're weak. So he says, I want you to fight a good fight. And then he said, it's for those who finish the race. The reward is for finishers. Finishers. You don't have to live the Christian life very long before you see people who fall out of the race and there's a variety of reasons you it into people all the time oh yeah I used to go to church I used to do that I used to this have been oh the preacher did this or someone else did this or somebody said this or this happened to me and there's a multitude of reasons that people don't finish start well and run well but then there's a reason they are not going to cross the finish line but we always watch the race to see who finishes. I want to finish well. I want to finish well. And then it's for those who remain faithful, staying true to the heart of God. You know, people who finish, listen carefully, people who finish not only give up, they, they never give up on what they're doing for God. But they never give up on God when He doesn't do what they thought He should do. It's easy to praise God when He answered the prayer the way you wanted Him to. It's easy to praise God, you know, when, when the baby's born and there's complications and you have everybody pray and the baby comes through and you hear the mother took him home. Praise God. 
But if the baby didn't make it through, and the baby passes away, does anybody still say, praise God? If you're praying, praying for money to get the bill paid, and the day comes, and the bill's due, and the money doesn't come in, do you still praise God? Or is it only when He comes through the way you want Him to come through? Hmm? You see, the, any of those things is, is what causes people to quit. And we cause people to quit because God didn't do what I, thought, I think He should have done. Hmm? And we may not always say it out loud, but that's what we're feeling in our heart. God didn't do what I thought He should do. Faith is, faith is singing praises to God and praying even when they just threw you in prison and you're in stocks like Paul and Silas did. I mean, they, they, get, they get thrown in prison. And by the way, why were they in Philippi to begin with? Because the vision was a guy saying, Come help us! And he said, so we didn't go over to Asia. Assuredly, we said we were assuredly gathered. We knew God was calling us to Philippi. Now they're in stocks. You know what they're doing? Praising God anyway. Say, Lord, what are we doing here? We didn't come here to get to this. Isn't, uh, how come we're in jail? I thought you wanted us to come here. What do we do to deserve this? I'm sorry, that's the 21st century version. They just praise God. Abraham, who said he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Even though he's 100 and Sarah's 90. And it was that faith that God credited him for righteousness. We were made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. That's, our, that's, our, that's, that's every believer's crown of righteousness. Amen? But to those who love the appearing of Christ and who are anxiously waiting and looking forward to the day when it will return for His saints, and because of that, we're faithfully staying in the race. <coughs> I don't love His appearing if I'm dropping out of the race. If I'm not fighting a good fight and finishing my course and keeping the faith, I don't love His appearing. I'll be ashamed at His appearing because I'm not prepared to meet Him. But the righteousness can refer to how we're living our life while we're still here. That righteousness we get from Christ is called justification. Our living a righteous life and our actions and our words and our behaviors called sanctification. God desires that we choose to live in righteousness. The Bible says it's not, it's not us by trying to try trying to try harder. The Bible says we're yielding our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It's yielding. And God will do the rest. But you have to want Him to do it. God doesn't take an unwilling vessel and make you do the right thing. God wants you to yield to Him. Are you willing to yield to Him? That means you take your hands off and you let God be in control. Most Christians are unwilling to do that. Or we'll do it for a little bit, and then when, it, when something comes up, we want it back. Say, I, no, no, Lord, I've got I to gotta have this. I've got to have this. And we won't let him have it. Incorruptible crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness. The fifth one and the last one is 1 Peter chapter 5. And this is the crown of glory. The crown of glory. Are you okay? We're almost done. 1 Peter 5. 
Verse number 1, the elders, which are the pastors, which are among you, I exhort, whom also, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, this is sometimes called the pastor's crown. It's going to be given to those who minister the Word of God faithfully. It could also, not, only, not, not just preachers, but evangelists, it could include teachers, Sunday school teachers, missionaries. Those who are teaching the Word of God and feeding the flock of God. It's, it's the importance of bringing up others in the ways of the Lord. Not only to salvation, but teaching them to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God places a great value on that. Place a great premium on that. We have, I feel like in our in our day and age, as we've seen the transition of churches into entertainment, we have seen we have seen the value of Bible preaching and Bible teaching go downhill. Where where now, uh, if the service is an hour and fifteen minutes, there's sometimes an hour of music and entertainment and about a fifteen minute sermon. And, and some of that is more psychology than it is Bible. And so we're, we're, we're missing out. And, and by the way, they'll miss out on this crown. It's those who will faithfully teach the Word of God and, and, and feed the flock of God. The only thing I have to feed you is this. It's the Word of God. But people at Bible Baptist Church have been feeding on the Word of God for 60 years. And the church of God has been feeding on that word for 2,000 years. And guess what? No one's exhausted it yet. There's still more. It's an amazing thing. Now you may say, well, I'm not a pastor, or that award can't be given to me, but let me show you how I think you might be able to receive this award. There's this reward. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Just to your left there just a little bit. And then put a finger over in Matthew chapter 10. Would you do that? Hebrews 13, and then put a finger in Matthew chapter 10. Hebrews 13 and Matthew 10. Okay? Now, Hebrews 13. Notice with me, if you will, verse number 17. The Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. It says, Submit yourself to those who have the, the rule or the authority over you. And in, in, in he's talking here in the context of the church and, and in the Christian life, and that be your pastor. Well, listen, has those that must give account. I'll give an account for those whom the Lord has put under me as a shepherd in the church. And I'll give an account for that. Okay? I'm, I, I, and I'll have accounting before God. And he says that I want to do it with joy and not with grief. Because, and listen, you would think that if I have to do it with grief, that that's bad for me. But what's the last line of the verse say? That's unprofitable for you. If you don't follow the teaching, if you don't submit yourself, then that's going to be accountable for you. And it's not going to be fun for you. But if you'll follow and submit to those who are looking out for your souls, for your best interests, the pastor, the pastor doesn't, I don't sit in my office and think, let's see, how can I make their life miserable this week? 
How can I, how can I take the fun and enjoyment out of their life this time? Sometimes that's what I think people think the pastor must do. And then the pastor's only desire is, I want to help you live for God. That's it. I just want you to experience God's best for your life. Any way I can. Now I want you to look at Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Notice what he says. Verse number 40. Matthew 10 and verse 40. He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. Now look, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. I think if you receive in that same thinking, I don't think it does the Scripture harm to say if you receive the pastor in the name of the pastor, you can receive the pastor's reward. I think that's what the Lord's teaching. But it, you have to be willing to submit to those whose authority you come under. But the crown of glory in 1 Peter is specifically for the pastor. Though I think that doesn't exclude others who will willingly submit to the leadership of the pastor. Listen, Paul said, be followers of me even as I also follow Christ. You can follow your pastor as long as he's following Christ. And by the way, if the pastor doesn't follow Christ, then you're, you're not obligated to follow him. I, I want you to follow what I say, but you, are, you have a right, as Berea, we talked about last week, you have a right to go to that book and say, and if there's something I'm telling you that you see the Bible says something different, you, you ought to be at my door saying, Pastor, I've got to talk to you. And say, I, help me understand, you said this, but what I read is this. What about that? And ask it in a nice way and ask it in a kind way. And listen, if this says one thing and I said another thing, I'm wrong and God's right. Pretty simple, all right? And, 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 and you ought to be doing that. Don't just take what the pastor says. You, you make sure it's what God says. I want you to do that. And, and we ought to desire you to do that. And so here's, here's what we got, and we'll be done. He says you get the crown by, by serving willingly. That's what it means by not by constraint, but willingly. Willingly, not by constraint. So you don't just do it because you have to. You get to do it because you want to. And you get that. And by the way, that creates the right atmosphere in the church. I'm not here tonight because I have to be. I really want to be here. I look forward to Wednesday night. And I enjoy being at church. And I, I love doing what I do. I, I was ready to come home. You asked my wife. If I could have jumped off the ship and swam in, I'd have come home three days early. I said, man, I'm ready to get back. I'm ready to go. I say, oh, it's work. It doesn't seem like work. And, and I just, I enjoy it. I, I, it's not constrained. It's willingly. And then he says he serves eagerly and not for filthy lucre. Willingly, not for filthy lucre, but for ready mind. Not serving for money. There's a responsibility the church has to take care of the pastor. The church takes care of us. Always has since we've come. The Bible says that's, that's a good thing. And when you, listen, and when you take care of the preacher, God blesses you. God, God enters into your finances because you're, you're participating in God's plan. When, when the widow, said, when Elijah said, make me a cake first, the widow obeyed. How'd that work out for her finances? Pretty good, didn't it? See, that's the principle that, that the Lord gives. But, but the pastor's not in it for the money. Somebody, you know, you, you ought to, sometimes just interesting, if some of you listen to some of the big time radio and television preachers, you ought to just Google sometime, what's the net worth of some of those folks? You will be amazed. Several of them recently, 23 million, 40 million, 68 million. Yeah. And, and, are we doing it willingly or are we doing it for filthy lucre? People like that begging you to help them stay on the air. 
All they have to do is sell a ring or two and they could pay for about a year's worth of broadcast. But I digress. I won't get off on that. And then he said to be, an, you get this crown if you're an example, not being lords over God heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Not just to reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering, as Paul told Timothy, but you're to set the example. I'm not just supposed to teach it, I'm supposed to live it. Don't say, no, it doesn't do any good, just like a parent, it doesn't do any good to say, now do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> that doesn't work, does it, mom and dad? You have, to, you have to set the example, and the pastor has to be the example. And so that's the, the crown for the pastor. Crown of life, the incorruptible crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory. Heard the testimony recently of an Olympic athlete who'd won five gold medals at, at the Winter Olympics. And a friend went to visit his home one day expecting to see his medals displayed. However, he didn't see any of them. And he asked where he kept his medals because he'd like to see them. And the fellow said, I don't have them. And he said, what'd you do with them? He said, well, the first one I gave to my mother because without her, I would have never made it. I gave another one to my younger brother because his support and encouragement saw me through. I gave one to my coach because he trained me and believed in me and pushed me to be the best I could be. And he went on and gave, it, gave all five away. You think about that. If you had worked and competed and gained those prizes, would you have been able to give them away? But the truth is, that's what God says we'll do with the crowns we gain. We'll, we, we have crowns we can win and I hope, I hope there's a passion and a desire to say, man, I don't just want to get along. I don't just want to get along. If there's a prize to win, if there's a crown to gain, I want my work for God to go through the fire with the gold and the silver and the precious stones and get the crown. But in Revelation it says, we'll gather around Him that sits on the throne and we'll fall down to worship Him and we'll cast those crowns at His feet. Because without Him, we can do nothing. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And without Christ, I can't do anything. You know what happens without Christ? Wood, hay, and stubble. It'll burn up. The things I did in my own strength, wood, hay, and stubble. Things I did for people to say, hey, look at me. Wood, hay, and stubble. Things I did because I loved Jesus Christ. Gold, silver, precious stones. Crowns. Five crowns that the believer can win. It's through Him and for Him and to Him that we live. That's what it's supposed to be. Boy, the world's look. I think God, listen, I think the world's looking for people to live this way. To see genuine Christians. Genuine believers. Let's, let's run. Let's, let's obtain. Let's get some crowns. Amen? Let's stand together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to our study here this evening. Lord, I pray that since you have laid out these crowns in your word, that each of us tonight would say, Lord, I'd like to obtain those crowns not for my glory, but to be able to cast them at your feet to say, thank you, Jesus, for life and life abundant, that we can enjoy the Christian life, enjoy living for you. We ought to do, we ought to do all these things we talked about just because you loved us and you gave yourself for us that we could have eternal life that you do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think, and you give us crowns that we can obtain. So, Lord, put it in our heart to excel for thee. 
do our very best for thee. To allow you to have your will and your perfect way in each one of our lives. That we would live to the praise and the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful you go with us from this place tonight. And may we others see Jesus and may we speak of him to others between now and the Lord's day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's sing together. Isn't he wonderful? Remember now Saturday, uh, if you're coming out Saturday, come early. And we'll, make, we'll have some men here kind of direct the parking a little bit to pack everybody in where we can get. If you want to park over there, feel free and walk, walk in. That would be great. Uh, we will park some back in the back in the gravel area back there. We'll get some cars back there. And uh, we'll just try to. But remember, when you go back there and park, you're not leaving early. Okay? Just, just saying. Because uh, you'll be hemmed in. All right? So uh, you're here for the duration of the blessing. Amen? All right? And uh, let's just uh, be servants. Look, look for ways to, to help and to serve, and uh, we'll have a great, great time. You're going to enjoy it. Well, I'm looking forward to it in a great way. All right? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Uh, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? I said, sing, this have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? God bless you. You're dismissed.